Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 81, Churchill, The Early Years. If you ask someone who knew something about Winston Spencer Churchill to tell you of his life, they would probably say he was born during the century before the Great War and World War II, had some hair-raising adventures when young, exactly what they could not say, spent time in the political wilderness, a phrase anyone who has skimmed the subject of the man seems to have heard, and then was called upon to save his country during its darkest hour. Well, yes and no. After all, he was in his mid-sixties when he got the call. He did have a life before that moment, and that life had its ups and downs. Put another way, nature abhors a vacuum, and there is a reason for that. Namely because nothing in history ever happens in a vacuum. Everything is connected in some degree to everything else, even if it is a few years removed. Winston Churchill was a man, take him for all in all, and I think that has been more or less forgotten, that he was simply born to save Britain from Hitlerism. He was indeed born, suffered the pangs of childhood, and thanks to his mother and father, certainly more severely than he ought to, grew up, faced bullies at school, unfortunately didn't have the correct body type to defend himself, strived to make his way in the world, and finally struggled to find himself. Except, I may be wrong on that last part. However many episodes it takes us to cover the life of this man, up to 1940, the underlying principle, the foundation, if you will, is that Churchill was a great man. But that statement needs clarifying. I certainly don't mean great by today's standards, like having a million likes on Facebook or being famous on YouTube, nor even how greatness was understood during the 20th century. Men who built monuments or large edifices. No, not even in that sense. Simply, I have no compunction in comparing Churchill to the likes of Gaius Marius, who revolutionized the Roman army after he came up through its ranks, or Lucius Cornelius Sulla, a man who spent the first 30 years of his life being a plaything for rich women who then had a chance, under Marius, to let his talents shine through all that, and eventually became a great general and leader in his own right. It was there all the time, even if he didn't see it. But I suspect that Churchill sensed his a bit earlier. Then there's Julius Caesar himself, a man much like Churchill, precocious, capable of great depth of understanding in things he cared about or was interested in. The sum of all this being the most important element, a natural-born leader. Someone who willingly walks into a crisis, nay, has to be held back from that crisis, is willing to take all responsibility, and believes, deep down, he knows what's best. Because he knows himself, which is the greatest mystery each of us must face. I fear that we will see fewer of his kind in our future. For all of this, I can't help but feel Churchill was born in the wrong time. His vision, mode of thought, and lust for combat meant he would have been much more comfortable, in a certain sense, around authors' round table. However, events in his later days played out in such a way that made it so his very nature, considered a throwback to an earlier time, was needed by those of the modern world. If only because another old soul, a man born to conquest, was his contemporary, Adolf Hitler. Churchill was a Victorian Tory, conservative in outlook, but like his father, and probably because of his father, never hesitated to challenge those men of similar views. And although he changed political parties a few times, that did not change him. He was not a Democrat with a small c, Instead, he was a man of the empire and championed, at least in his youth, the ways that empire was forged. Ironically, he was born during the British Empire's height and left this world as it was shedding the last of its colonies. Getting back to my premise that Churchill never had defined himself, that to some degree 
he knew who he was, or rather, simply was who he was, and did not have to carry on in the great search that most of us spend our lives doing. And in that self-awareness is one of the key ingredients to greatness. As I have at least five Churchill bios in my library, I could, with very little prodding, continue on in this vein for pages. But instead, let's begin at his beginning. Well, perhaps one last parting shot. Winston was flesh and blood. He had his ups and downs. He, like everyone else, had no idea what the future held. He didn't know that his time would be during the time in a man's life when most, if not all, consider their time to have passed. We here will continue on until the man and his time meet in 1940. And that moment can best be described by a line from a time before the Victorians. The time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was born on November 30th, 1874. For a point of reference, as for the men who would become his world-changing allies or enemies, Hitler was born in April of 1889, Roosevelt in January of 1882, Stalin in December of 1878, and Mussolini in July of 1883. By the long-established rules of England, then Britain, our Churchill was simply called Mr. Churchill. That's because two generations had to pass for a bloodline not of the oldest male born before a noble was once again a commoner. So, our Churchill's grandfather, on his father's side, was John Winston Spencer Churchill, the seventh Duke of Marlborough. His oldest son, our Churchill's uncle, George Charles Spencer Churchill, was the first born and the 8th Duke of Marlborough. His only son, Charles, our Churchill's cousin, was the ninth and last Duke of Marlborough. Because our Churchill's father, Randolph, was the youngest son of John Winston Spencer Churchill, he was called Lord Randolph. And finally, coming round full circle, as our Churchill was the second generation of John Winston Spencer Churchill, he was simply called Mr. Churchill. On Tuesday, November 24th, 1874, Jenny Churchill, formerly Jenny Jerome, was walking with a shooting party when she took a bad fall. She insisted to all that asked that she and the seventh-month-old within her womb were both equally fine. The following Saturday, she took a rather rough ride in a bouncing pony carriage. It was then her labor began. Considering how much Winston roughhoused as a small child, he probably enjoyed his time in utero. Despite all that had happened, Jenny, who loved parties, but that was an understatement, insisted on attending the annual St. Andrew's Ball being held at Blemen. Ignoring advice from loved ones, she appeared on the dance floor in a loose gown, waiting to start. Not unexpectedly, the labor pains soon started. The dancing was over, but not the dance. That continued on gaily without her. The child was coming. Jenny tried to make it to her bedroom, which meant walking past numerous drawing rooms, through the library, the longest room in England, but fainted before reaching her destination. She was then picked up and taken to a side room. Ironically, the room that night was being used as the ladies' cloak room, as Jenny lay gasping in reaction to the increasingly frequent contractions, guests had someone steal into the room and gently pull out from under the soon-to-be mother velvet capes and feather boas. Jenny never knew. The London obstetrician Jenny wanted couldn't be there before Monday, due to the trains. So the local doctor of Woodstock, Frederick Taylor, had to be summoned. He may not have been fashionable, but he was certainly competent. Winston was born at 1.30 a.m. November 30th. His father, Lord Randolph, wrote that his son was in perfect health, considering his prematureness. And there, right at Winston's birth, contention started. 
Although the London Times parroted what his father wrote in his diary about the early arrival of the boy, everyone else, from the locals of Woodstock to the patrician friends of the family, guessed that, as this was November, that meant that sometime last February, before their wedding, Jenny managed to remove enough layers of clothing to conceive Winston. These rumors followed Winston all of his life, and he reveled in them. His reply was, quote, Although present on the occasion, I have no clear recollection of the events leading up to it. End quote. For some, Churchill was born with looks that only a mother could love. Well, in this case, a grandmother. And that was fortunate for Churchill's American mother, Frances, Duchess of Marlborough, who made everyone at Blenheim tremble with fear took one look at Winston's, or Winnie's, turned-up nose, red curls, and strange pallid eyes, and fell in love. It was Frances, or Duchess Fanny, that smoothed Jenny's way into the Churchill family. Considering the date of Winston's conception, the wedding date, and Jenny's lineage. So carried away, it was Duchess Fanny that saw to the diapers, cradle, and everything else needed upon the arrival of a new babe. Some used this unpreparedness of the parents to prove Winston's prematurity. Others say it proves that his parents were completely self-absorbed. In either case, all was settled as the baby was baptized, Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, on December 27, 1874, by the Duke's chaplain at Blenheim in the palace chapel. Being born in this palace and having the lineage he did, I'm sure that much was expected of baby Winston. After all, on his father's side, Winnie was descended from the first Earl Spencer and from the famous soldier John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, commander of the coalition of armies that fought the French at the beginning of the 18th century and who never lost a battle. And on his mother's side, completely American, was his mother's father, Leonard Jerome, a successful New York stockbroker, financier, and newspaper owner. He made and then spent several fortunes during his lifetime. His ancestors, so therefore Winston's ancestors, fought with General Washington for American independence. The new year found the Churchill family back in London. And as Winston was one month old, tradition decreed it was time for a nanny. A Mrs. Elizabeth Ann Everest was brought into the home. She was not married. Certain positions, like nannies, came with the title Mrs. It was this lady that would love Winston, be there for him in good times and bad, and hear his cries as he poured out his woes. She would be his emotional confidant. Of the many duties of a nanny, a daily part of her ritual was to get the child ready for the parent's goodnight kiss. If I make the sound warm and inviting, I certainly don't mean to, at least not in Winston's case. The child was scrubbed and dressed and then presented himself for inspection, while Mrs. Everest, or Womb, as Winnie called her, reported on his daily behavior. Womb became her name for the child, as he later tried to say, woman. Alas, it seems that Lord Randolph and Jenny could not even spare enough time to fulfill this part of their limited parental duties. But in their defense, there was too much fun to be had. They were always attending balls, parties, galas, or hosting them, and always to a point beyond their means. For example, Jenny recorded that the greatest misfortune during Winston's early years was when a renowned hairdresser was struck with a sudden illness right before a major ball. The time her oldest son nearly died of pneumonia seems to have escaped her memory. At the top of this social world, so important to Winston's parents, was the Prince of Wales and his wife, Alexandra. It should have been the Queen, but since her husband's death, she had withdrawn herself from such activities. That hole was more than filled by the man waiting to become king. And one day in 1876, much to Jenny's horror, Lord Randolph's behavior 
or rather, the behavior of George's brother, and Randolph's subsequent code of brotherly loyalty, caused the Churchills to become social outcasts. To write of British aristocracy at this time is to write of duels, ruined marriages, and revenge. But here is the short version. George, Randolph's brother, attempted to elope with a married woman whose husband was currently touring India with the Prince of Wales. The lady, who had strayed from her wedding bed with George, Edith, wrote to her husband of her intent. Word got out. George's father, the seventh Duke of Marlborough, was horrified. So he had a son-in-law try to talk sense into his headstrong son. Nothing doing. Then Edith's brother challenged George to a duel. Now enter Randolph, with more loyalty than brains. He declared that only Edith's current husband could duel George. But it turns out that one of Edith's past lovers was none other than His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Randolph should have backed down when he found this out and talked sense into his brother. But instead, he poured gas on the fire. Edith had kept His Royal Highness's love letters to her, and now she gave them to Randolph, who declared to very talkative friends that he had the crown prince in his back pocket. But if that wasn't enough, Randolph, demonstrating his total lack of finesse, then went to see the Princess of Wales. It's not clear if he talked of the letters, but he certainly asked the lady to talk to her husband to see if she could convince the injured husband not to divorce his wife. The Queen soon learned of all this and was upset. His Royal Highness, however, was enraged. He made it clear to everyone that mattered that George and Randolph were not only not allowed in his presence, but that he would not enter the house of anyone who entertained them. Socially, which is all that mattered to people at this socio-economic level, the two men and their families no longer existed. Jenny, one can imagine, was mortified beyond belief, but His Royal Highness was unmoved. So Randolph turned to Prime Minister Disraeli, begging for advice. Dizzy, as his intimates called him, then told Duchess Fanny, Randolph's mother, there was only one way out of this mess. The position of Lord Lieutenancy of Ireland had previously been offered to Randolph's father. He had turned it down. The position would be offered again. Disraeli suggested the man take the post this time and take his son Randolph and his family with him. In other words, get out of town, give this matter time to cool down, and let the Prince of Wales have his victory. Time would do the rest. So, one chilly morning, the Duke, his son Randolph, Fanny, his mother, Jenny, and other relatives, along with young Winston, climbed aboard the mail steamer Connock and crossed over to Kingstown to start their sentence. They would be in Dublin for the next three years. Showing a bit of maturity, Lord Randolph studied the vexing problem of Ireland within the larger empire. But Jenny was unchanged and unrepentant. She focused on her happiness and found those who wanted to make her happy. By the end of the first year, Mrs. Everest was complaining to Winston's mother that his clothes were disgraceful. He didn't have enough, and what he did have were not up to snuff. Jenny, who wore a diamond in her hair, retorted there wasn't enough money for such things. Womb would have to make do. Now a young boy, Winnie could see for himself that his hired lady loved him, and he intellectually assumed his mother did as well. But Womb showed her love. His mother did not. In later years, this caused much confusion for the young man he was to become, in matters of the other sex. And when he did find someone who loved him, it came as a wonder. As he was always pushed aside by those who should have been holding him close, the boy started to act out but not against his parents. He was still hoping to win them over. And not against Womb, well, not too much, because she was on his side. 
But when Jenny hired a governess, someone not of his inner circle, and who tried to tell him what to do, well, Winston aimed his hostility at her. Hey everyone, Ray here. We've all been there. Seemingly out of nowhere, you get hit by an unexpected bill, and your world just stops. When that happens, you panic, so it's hard to think, what are my options? Well, that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart is here to help. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt or help you survive that unexpected bill with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. And just know, you are not alone. Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers who are on their path to financial freedom with a fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And Upstart knows that you are more than just your credit score, which is why they factor in your income, employment, and other information in your loan application. That's how they get you the best deal. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. The youngest Churchill could not quite understand why this lady wanted to ruin his fun, his adventures with his toys, his time in the garden, and was always asking him about letters and numbers. If that famous scowl did not visit his face before this time, one can certainly imagine it appearing at this moment. Thinking that blood was thicker than water, Winston brought his feelings of unhappiness to his mother. Expectantly, she took the other adult's side. And this is where Winnie's life becomes darker. His mother, for whatever reason, certainly it was a different time and different ways of life, seems to have kept Winston at arm's length. This would not change in the future. Of her and this time in his life, Churchill wrote 50 years later, quote, She shone for me like the evening star. I loved her dearly, but at a distance. Unquote. This was certainly true, but not at first. He tried to please his mother and become a part of her life, but was not allowed. And always waiting with open arms and ready to lend an ear to his diatribes was Mrs. Everest. In time, Winston stopped going to his mother in times of distress. He knew what the end result would be. Instead, Womb was the one who heard all his hopes and dreams and troubles. In February of 1880, Lady Randolph Churchill gave birth to her second son, John, called Jack. Winston heard the good news from his father. Later that year, the family returned to London. The Churchills had done their time, but it would be four more years before they would be allowed into the presence of the Prince of Wales, and then the Prince would take his revenge. The following year, 1881, Winnie celebrated his seventh birthday, and then he and Jack spent Christmas at Blenheim. Just like at Christmas, the boys spent New Year's apart from their parents. It was then that Winston wrote his first letter to his mother. He expressed his joy that they were coming to see him and Jack. He ended the letter with kisses. He worked on his letters, and his second letter, also to his mother, was dated January 4th, 1882. His first letter was undated, but had just recently gone out. This one read, My dear Mama, I hope you are quite well. I thank you very, very much for the beautiful presence. Those soldiers and flags and castle, they are so nice. It was so kind of you and dear Papa. I send you my love and a great many kisses. Your loving Winston. When he was not being helped, word for word, by womb, his spelling was atrocious. However, his writing and grasp of the English language became easier year after year. Mathematics was another story altogether. The figures and columns absolutely made no sense to him. 
This did not improve as much as many would have liked by the time he became Chancellor of the Exchequer. For almost a year, Winston seemed to have given in to his governess's desire, and he started reading on his own. But when she saw what he was reading, she didn't know what to make of it. Instead of the more basic books she brought him, he was devouring the daily newspaper, mostly the articles concerning politics. The year before, in April of 1881, Disraeli had died, and Lord Randolph spoke of the great loss to the country. Politics had grabbed the boy's attention. It never let go. His governess had to settle for that. That fall of 1882, Winston was told he would be attending a boarding school. His mother already thought of him as a troublesome boy, and his two years at St. George's boarding school would do nothing to alter this opinion. His father seemed a bit more understanding, but whether that was real or not, it certainly would change for the worse in time. But not everyone thought so of young Winston. His mother's sister, Leone, thought Winnie was, quote, full of fun and quite unselfconscious during her visits, unquote. What Winston did not know when he was on his way to St. George's boarding school near Ascot was that the term was already half over. And considering how miserable he became just days after showing up, that information probably would have helped him tremendously. Still, with a month to go before his eighth birthday, Winnie found himself with a headmaster instead of a governess. It's understandable that a boy not yet eight, who went from mostly plain to mostly lessons, would have a hard time adjusting and act out or not conform to school ways. Unfortunately for the students, there was to be only one form of punishment, flogging. According to one witness who saw Winston beat, it only took one swish or two of the birch before blood could be seen on the child's bare bottom. But with Winston's sensitive skin, this already dramatic practice took on a new dimension. But the reverend who administered the punishments usually went up to 15 or 20 swats, regardless of the child's pleas or screams. Winnie's two years at St. George was full of hatred, fear, and anxiety, and did not include a single visit from either parent. Thus treated, especially a child of stubbornness, this one, it's no surprise his grades and performance suffered. But the man that history would know began to emerge. His conduct was never acceptable. His defiant nature was never broken. But he did make strides in history, geography, and French. And that was because he found them interesting. It had nothing to do with the stick or the teachers. His spelling remained atrocious, and at meals he was considered greedy. Focusing in on his nature, his defiance towards authority and literally doing something he did not want to do not only emerged, but it was tested and found not wanting. He was beat over and over, but stayed true to what he thought was right. He was too young to call it standing on principle. Instead, Winston was acting intuitively against something he felt was unfair. After one particular beating, Winnie retaliated by finding the headmaster's straw hat and stomped it to pieces. In his letters home, Winnie at first lied about liking the school. Most boys did. They think or are conditioned to believe the fault is in themselves. It was a time for a stiff upper lip, which all boys of Winston's social status were expected to understand and implement. During those two years, his parents never visited, and they rarely posted a letter to the boy. A few times, Womb and Jack were allowed to visit, which Winnie appreciated greatly. Probably the best example of why his mother never visited was on one of the few letters that came to St. George's. Listed on the back of a letter to her son, Jenny wrote the names of those to be invited to her next party. The Reverend H. W. Sneed Kinnersley, the sadistic headmaster, seemed to believe that hitting the stubborn Winston harder each time he came before him was the answer. The only answer. 
This running battle lasted for two years. After one particular intense beating, Winston made his way to Mrs. Everest, only a few miles away. She tried to calm the child and change his clothes. It was then that she saw why the child was crying and hated the school. Outraged, she called Jenny to see for herself the condition of Winnie's backside. All along the boy's back and bottom were crisscrossed lines where the birch wood had made contact. We don't know her immediate reaction, but Jenny pulled Winnie out of St. George's. For all we know, Randolph was never told. As a parent myself, I'm happy to report that Mr. Sneed Kernersley died two years later, age 38, of a heart attack. That fall, and it's no wonder, Winston's health failed him. The family doctor, Robson Roos, recommended that the boy go to a school near the sea. His own son went to a school in Brighton, and if they sent Winnie there, Roos promised to keep an eye on him. Jenny was all for this, but honestly, in her eyes, Winnie went from a troublesome boy to being considered very delicate, as in still not quite measuring up. The school at Brighton was run by two sisters, and Winston generally enjoyed it, certainly compared to what he had just left. The term began in September of 1884, and that November, Winston had his 10th birthday. But bad news always seemed to follow any good news that came his way. He then found out that his father, who seemed to be much more on his side than his mum, left for India for four months. And I'm sure his father's absence is connected to this next part. Winnie never hesitated to act out when anyone tried to discipline him. Still, the sisters treated Winston with as much kindness and love as they could muster, and slowly, slowly, he responded. His grades in subjects that interested him, English, French, and scripture knowledge, improved. Winston might not have had his bottom beat anymore, but there were other adventures to be had. That December, his mother received a note that Winston had received a slight wound on his chest. It seems that, during an argument with another boy, they argued over a knife the teacher lent them for work. The boy stabbed at Winston, and the knife went in about a quarter of an inch. The other boy had been in trouble before, and his parents were summoned to take him away. Churchill, with Dr. Roos in tow, returned to London for a few days of rest. His mother wrote to Winston's father, quote, Of course, as I thought, he began by pulling the other boy's ear. Unquote. The location of the wound, nor how deep the blade sank in, ever made it into the letter. Lord Randolph Churchill wrote back, Thankful the boy was not more seriously hurt. Winston finished recovering from the wound that Christmas of 1884. He was thrilled to be with his mother. She, less so. She wrote to her husband that she could not, on her own, handle Winston, so she was calling back Mrs. Everest from her Christmas break. Soon, in early 1885, Churchill returned to school and wrote his mother that she must be happy that he was away. No screaming or yelling. He ended the letter with, quote, it must be heaven on earth, unquote. I can't imagine she tried to hide her feelings of frustration or disappointment with him, as he openly spoke of it in his many letters. Of course, he never stopped asking her to visit him. Back at school, some of his marks improved, again, in the classes he found interesting. He came in first in classics, third in French, but the rest remained poor. His marks and conduct, unfortunately, remained at the bottom. That summer of 1885, the Liberal government was defeated in the House of Commons. Gladstone was out. The Conservative leader, Lord Salisbury, formed a new government with Churchill's father as his Secretary of State for India, hence his need to visit the country. As for Winnie and his brother, they spent the summer apart from their parents at Cromer by the North Sea. 
Churchill wrote to his mother, begging to see her. And in response to this plea, Winnie's mother had a governess sent to him. His lessons started up again by the sea. Then, for whatever reason, no psychoanalyzing here, Winston got a rash on his legs, and his temperature rose to 100. It was as if his body was reacting to having his vacation ruined. That fall, Winston had returned to school, and soon found out that his father had been in Brighton to make a speech, but had not stopped by the school. The boy was crushed. But in all fairness to Lord Randolph, he was busy dealing with King Theba of Burma, who was attacking British interests. But once a military expedition was decided against the king, his days were numbered. On January 1st, 1886, as Winston was winding down his Christmas break, Burma was annexed to the British Empire. Not that this helped the Conservatives in the House of Commons. They were defeated that same January. Lord Randolph got himself a seat in Parliament, but the Liberals were back in power. In March of 1886, Winnie came down with pneumonia and, for three days, was at death's door. But Dr. Ruse stayed by his side, fighting the symptoms as best he could, and focused on the boy's temperature. As long as it didn't go over 105, he felt he would not lose the child. And it worked. By the 17th, Winston was out of the woods, but he had lost all of his strength. He didn't return to school until the term's end. But at least he got to see his father twice. The first time, Randolph brought grapes, and when he returned in April, he brought a toy steam engine. During the scare, the whole family, on both sides, prayed for Winston, and he was never allowed to forget his American side, though not from his mother. Jenny was relieved, but was beyond changing or wanting to change her way of life. This was because this was her time. She was young, beautiful, and famous. She had her picture in shop windows, and was a much sought-after amateur pianist. She even had her own social schedule. Each autumn, she would leave on her annual tour of Scotland's country houses. She received the Order of the Crown of India from the Queen herself, and had various lovers from around the island and the continent. Again, Jenny was relieved that Winston had survived, but now that he had, it was time for her to return to her life. Likewise so, Lord Randolph, relieved that his oldest son was recovering, focused on his future. That July of 1886, he stood for election and won a seat for South Paddington. And for the Conservatives, the news only got better. During the debates and party battles over giving Ireland home rule, 77 Liberals broke away from their party and joined the Conservatives over this issue. This union allowed Lord Salisbury to form his second administration. The result was that a new political party, the Conservative and Unionist Party, was in the offing. Fifty-three years later, Winston was its leader. And, as Lord Randolph had supported the Liberal Unionist breakaway, his reward was the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer in Salisbury's government. All this good news for his father, who Winnie idolized, and the family's prospects in general, certainly brightened the boy's mood, who, when he returned to school, excelled, again, in classes he found interesting. But his marks improved in those other classes as well. Winston also discovered he had an amazing capacity for memorization. Whether in a school contest or simply because he loved a particular piece of poetry, young Winston was able to memorize entire passages. He could still recite from memory his favorite poems 50 years later. Coming out of his shell, Winnie also pushed himself to excel in riding and swimming. Not having the body of a warrior or like his beloved toy soldiers, his fear of competition was gradually being pushed aside as his imagination and ego found their footing.
In correspondence between son and mother, another element was added. Winston was taking an interest in the world around him, but not just his world. He commented on Brighton enlarging a parade, the cost being borne by the taxpayers. In his opinion, not that his mother or anyone else asked him, it was a waste. His father certainly would have agreed, but Jenny, as usual, did not reply. Of course, the other elements of their relationship were still there. Churchill reached out for his mother's love. His mother disciplined him from a distance. And, showing his age, the boy was now always asking for more money. And, like father, like son, days after Winston complained about Brighton wasting 19,000 pounds, his father announced his intention to reduce government expenditures, while at the same time changing the tax policy to be more fair to the lower economic strata of Britain. Keep in mind that Lord Randolph's grasp of economic matters was no firmer than what his sons would one day be. The Conservatives were back in power, and Salisbury knew that much of the credit had to go to Lord Randolph, who was awarded with the second most powerful position in the government. The Prime Minister also knew that Randolph wanted his job, but didn't feel that the young man was up to it. Salisbury decided that he had to reward Randolph's hard work and loyalty, but that didn't mean he had to protect the younger man if he got into any trouble. So Salisbury, the veteran politician, decided to wait things out and give Winston's father enough rope to hang himself. It took six months. When Lord Randolph submitted his budget, it was with the idea of asking the Secretary of State of War and the First Lord of the Admiralty to cut their expenditures. This was against what Salisbury wanted, but he said nothing. The rest of October went by, and then November, and most of December, but still the two major parts of the government said nothing about cutting their spending. Overestimating his value to Salisbury and his general popularity within the party, the Chancellor of the Exchequer then wrote a letter to the Prime Minister stating that, as he did not want to cause tension within the Cabinet over this matter, he was left with no choice but to offer up his resignation. Obviously, this was a ploy to wake up everyone, including the Prime Minister, to his cause. But Salisbury finally had the young upstart where he wanted him, and took the letter at face value. Lord Randolph was 37 years old, had held the post for mere months, and would never hold office again. For a while, he could be seen among the backbenchers, but honestly, spent more time at the racetrack. He gambled a lot, but he won a lot as well. His son handled his father's fall from grace quite differently. The February of the next year, 1887, Winston was at a pantomime at Brighton, where an insulting sketch of his father was performed. At first, Winston was shocked. Then tears came down his face. Then the anger and hurt surfaced. The performer saw this and continued on behind Winston's back. The frustrated boy whirled on the man and said, quote, Stop that row, you snub-nosed radical. Unquote. One can only guess at what his response would have been had he been ten years older. Winston quickly went from that battle to another. That summer of 1887, the jubilee of Queen Victoria was to be celebrated, and Winston wanted to go. But as his father was in Morocco at the time, the boy had to convince his mother. It took three desperate letters, but he won out in the end. Here is a part of his first letter. My dear Mama, Miss Thompson doesn't want me to go home for the Jubilee, and because she says that I shall have no place in Westminster Abbey, and so it is not worth going. Also, that you will be very busy and unable to be with me much. Now you know this is not the case. I want to see Buffalo Bill and the play as you promised me. I shall be very disappointed. Disappointed is not the word. I shall be miserable after you have promised me and all 
I shall never trust your promises again, but I know that Mummy loves her Winnie too much for that. But, having worked so hard to be there, one would think that Winston would have behaved himself better. But upon returning to Brighton, his first letter to his mother included the line, quote, I hope you will soon forget my bad behavior while at home, unquote. But now, back at school, it was back to work. And maturing, Winston focused on his weak point, Greek. He knew he would have to do much better to get into whatever preparatory school his father decided on. And his marks improved accordingly. As summer break was approaching, Winston made plans, but so did his mother. He wanted to spend some time in Paris or on the continent. His mother wanted him to spend time with a tutor. But now age 12, Winston got better at presenting his arguments, especially in writing. But Jenny was still more than capable of parrying his thrusts. Instead, she put forward a compromise. He would not go to Paris, but to Brighton to study, where he would have a tutor, but a master Greek tutor. And she would allow some time for him to be with Jack and Mrs. Everest on the Isle of Wight. So, agreeing to the compromise, undoubtedly not feeling like a compromise, Winston returned to Brighton. It was then he found out that there had been a change of plans. Instead of Winchester, the school he was preparing for, his parents wanted him to take the examination for Harrow. This decision was based on his health, as Harrow was on a hill. Since 1722, Churchill boys, six generations of them, had gone to Eton. But Dr. Roos suggested Winston stay away from there. Nearby Windsor Castle, soaked with fogs, Eton could only be bad for a boy with a weak chest. So Winston was steered toward Winchester. After all, Lord Randolph's brother sent his son, Charles, to Winchester, and the boy liked it. So why not? Churchill would have a friend and prepare himself at Winchester. But then, family got in the way. Lord Randolph's father had recently passed away, and as his brother George was the oldest and therefore latest Duke of Marlborough, many of the family possessions went to him. And, like so many of his class, the new duke was heavily in debt. To pay some of this off, he began selling off family possessions, like the family library, jewels, and paintings. Then, in his typical intense, no-holds-barred manner, Randolph denounced George for this, who no longer spoke to him. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale, reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash World War II, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash World War II right now. Shopify.com slash World War II. It was then that Dr. Roos recommended Harrow. On a hill, it was much better for Winston's chest, and it wasn't Winchester. Randolph quickly agreed. All settled, Winston was looking forward to coming home for Christmas and decided to plan out the family's holidays himself. It was not to be. 
During his break of 1887, as he took his preliminary exams for Harrow, his father informed the boy that his parents would be on a seven-week tour of Russia. Winston was disappointed, but told his mother in a letter that he would, quote, make the best of a bad job, unquote. The boy was learning, despite his stubborn nature, you can't always get what you want. After much studying, finally the day came. On Friday, March 16th, 1888, Winston went to Harrow, met headmaster J.E.C. Weldon, and was given his entrance exam. But to his horror, there were no questions about what he felt he was ready for. Grammar, history, French, geography. Instead, he was asked to translate Greek and Latin passages. Thrown off, the boy froze up. His panic increasing, he then found himself unable to even recall the Greek alphabet. It only got worse from there. The Latin part of his exam was, besides his name and a Roman numeral one, left blank. This was to be a pattern for Winston. Breezy confidence before an exam, only to freeze up at the moment of truth. All of his knowledge staying locked in his brain. But of course, he was told that he would be allowed to enter Harrow. His father was a famous former cabinet member, after all. The headmaster couldn't know that Lord Randolph would never hold office again. But there was a downside. Winston was already labeled a problem student. On April 17, 1888, after a holiday at Blenheim with the Duchess Fanny, Winnie arrived at Harrow. On the morrow, he would find what form or placing he was in. The next morning, the boys and their parents, of course not Winston's, were standing around as the boys' names were called out in public in order of scholastic results. Then the boys would walk in a line in order of being called out. The parents listened as their child's names were called out, but also they wanted to see where the son of the famous Lord Randolph ranked. Winston's name was called third from last. But as the two lowest boys had withdrawn, that left the embarrassed redhead with sensitive skin, his face growing redder by the second, to bring up the rear. As Churchill walked by, someone said, quote, Why, he's the last of all! Unquote. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Um, there's a couple more things I wanted to share with you about Winston that I wasn't able to stick into the storyline, but they're worth knowing because they're very um, significant or charming, and I just had to share it with you. Um, besides uh, his near-death experience, uh, the other illnesses that he had were normal for the time, uh, but my favorite one, if I can say that, is when he got the measles, and he accidentally gave those measles to his mother's current lover, the Austrian sportsman, Count Charles Kinski. Um, so that really upset his mother a lot because they had to um, stop what they were doing. As for Lord Randolph, he was um, likewise engaged with other ladies. Uh, but for him, it caught up to him and he contracted uh, syphilis. Uh, he had passed through the first two stages of syphilis before he met Jenny. And then the third stage um, started around 1881, which is when I think she started taking on um, other lovers. So when they were in Ireland and Jenny had sworn off her husband, um, she found other lovers while there for those three years. And one of them was a Lieutenant Colonel John Strange Jocelyn. Um, he was um, Jack's biological father. So Jenny, being very bold, decided to call the child John Strange Spencer Churchill. Um, wow. When she got back to um, Britain, the older ladies kind of pulled her aside and said, look, we really, you don't do that kind of thing. Go ahead and have your lovers, but be a little more discreet and certainly don't name your offspring after your lover instead of your husband because he loses a tremendous amount of face. So um, Jenny became a very disciplined and very good um good at having lovers and being discreet about it and her husband of course knew about it but he really couldn't say anything because he had done the same thing um so she was focused on having all this fun but she took it very seriously and she became um an observer of the proper rules and etiquette 
And I hope I'm not giving too much away, but one of her lovers uh, in the future is actually the Prince of Wales, who later becomes King Edward VII. So when I said he would get his revenge on Randolph, um, I really meant it. And that's, uh, that's in the future. And uh, now getting back to Churchill, uh, Lord Randolph very soon will not like his son anymore. And there were many different theories about why this was. But um, was it the syphilis? Was he losing his mind? Um, Some people said that he was a homosexual, which really no one seriously believes. But sadly for Winston, his father's not going to like him very much. And then his father is going to die prematurely. And so Winston can't have a chance to figure all this out and make up with his father and have closure. So it's just another um, sad part of his life. But focusing on a different part of Churchill's life, and I found this very interesting. I know it's a different time and they were different people and it was different ways. Um, But Churchill never bathed himself. He never dressed himself. He never undressed himself. And one time, I think before he was a teenager, he was spending time with his cousin, the future ninth Duke of Marlborough. And uh, he was brushing his teeth before his uh, valet could get there. And it wasn't frothing up like normal. And his cousin told him, well, you have to put toothpaste on it first. That's what makes it froth. So just a very different time. And he had a very different life than any of us probably will ever be able to imagine. But some people say that it's that kind of um, having those people around him do things for him that he learned to, not in a bad way, control people and work with people and get things done through people and to become a leader. So that's one of the theories that um, that's out there. And I just thought that was interesting. And I wanted to share that with you. And switching gears here, the tour is looking um, really good this year. I think it's really going to happen. We just need a couple more people. So again, just send me an email. Um, you can go to the website, worldwar2podcast.net. You can email me there. Um, and for those of you who have already emailed me, um, we're still finalizing the last bit of the itinerary, but you will we'll all get a blast email. So I'm not ignoring you. I'm just waiting for it to come out. I'm as excited as you are. Um, so if anyone else is interested, Interested, please send me an email. I'll make sure you get on the initial release of all the information. And I hope to see as many of you as I possibly can this fall. So please don't hesitate to send me an email. Um, for those who have recently signed up for membership or donated, um, I'm really sorry this episode is pushing an hour. So I'll thank you next time, if that's okay, on uh, episode 82. Oh, and sorry, one last thing. <laughs> um, if you're looking for an audible recommendation, um, the there's several different Churchill bios on, on Audible. Um, some are good, some are not so good. Um, one, the first one of William Manchester is absolutely amazing. You cannot get any more detail. Um, in fact, you don't even need to listen to me if you get this. It's it's like 40 hours long or something like that. Um, just to give you an idea, you will spend the first five hours of the audiobook listening to Victorian England. Uh, He does a really amazing job of setting up the world that Churchill will be born into. And don't take it the wrong way. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, The man can write like no other. And uh, David Case, who reads it with his um, uh, crisp English accent, does a really great job. And he does a very good job of his impersonations of Churchill for the many quotes. So if you want to uh, look at that, you definitely should. And you will not be disappointed. So I will see you as soon as I can with episode 82. I'm sorry this one took so long. At first it was 20 pages. I wasn't sure what to cut out. So um, go get the audio book and you won't have to worry about it. But I will see you guys as soon as I can. Um, Take care, everyone.